working. All right, welcome folks. My name is Abram Dickerson. Really excited to be here with Aspire Adventure Running and to host our Deeper Not Further athlete panel with Kyle McCochran, Jenny Abeg, and Caitlin Gerben. Say hi, folks. Hello. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what we're really trying to do here tonight, so Aspire organizes multi-day wilderness and backcountry trips for runners. Um, over the years, we've developed kind of a portfolio of trips. And personally, I come from a kind of a climbing and alpine background um, and have always been really curious about combining kind of the fitness that endurance athletes have, you know, with some technical skills and what sort of things that opens up in the mountains. Um, and so we're stepping into a place of organizing skills courses for runners. But I wanted to have a conversation with these characters who each of whom has a pretty extensive alpine and running background um, to get a sense of, of how they got to be where they are. Um, maybe I'll let, so I'm not doing a ton of talking, Kyle and then Jenny and Caitlin, do you guys just want to do a quick intro of kind of how you came to this position of integrating running and sort of alpine curiosities? Yeah, so my name's Kyle McCrown. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I actually went to Inglemore High School in the Seattle area. And I was really into cross country, um, did it a lot in junior high and high school. And so I had that trail running background and uh, started to get into hiking with my friends uh, around my senior year of high school and we had a driver's license and just always kind of you know, did one trail like Mount Sai, Mount Pilchuck, and always looked at the next peak and wondered how to get there. Um, started researching things and started to discover that we needed to learn about off-trail navigation. Soon we needed to get an ice axe. And eventually, you know, a few years later, I ended up going up Mount Rainier um, and learning to be on glaciers. So it was kind of a gradual process, um, built up a lot of skills. And now my favorite thing to do is like blend trail running and fast and light movement with the more technical skills and in, in the mountains. Cool. Welcome. Sorry for pronouncing your name wrong. That's my bad. I, I apologize for that. So it's no McCrowan. Yes, it. McCrowan. Awesome. Jenny. I'm Jenny Abeg, although nobody knows how to say my last name. Um, I grew up in British Columbia, just on like the northern side of the North Cascades and definitely grew up spending a lot of time in the mountains and then got really into rock climbing in my 20s and was never a runner. Um, but during COVID, I started running and uh, it was a way for me to get out without having to worry about carpooling and people. And um, so that summer, it wasn't the typical summer of like climbing in Washington and at Washington Pass and then the enchantments and like getting out into the mountains and, um, but I had running. And so I started using running as a way to get into the mountains and it kind of just evolved. Like, I think I went out one day and realized like, oh, if I walk a 20 minute mile, I can, um, have a 50 mile day in the daylight. And then it just like kept going from there where I realized that I could run faster than 20 minute miles and have long days. So I I'm now like more into running definitely. Um, but uh, kind of got into it through through climbing and then mountains and then mountain running. Great, awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to your perspective on things. This is gonna be great. <laughs> Caitlin. Yeah. Hey everybody. Um, I'm Caitlin Gerben, um, and I'm based in Issaquah, Washington, but I actually come from Wisconsin, which is where I grew up and spent a lot of time as a kid, like just out in the woods camping running around the fields, but, you know, didn't have any access to mountains or even really know what was possible to do in the mountains. Um, so I think like most people probably are familiar with me from my running career. Um, I do a lot of racing um, across the world, mostly like 50 to 100 mile distances. Um, but, you know, what I think for me, especially relevant to this panel is that I actually started doing other things in the mountains way before I started trail running. Um, and so I moved to Seattle in, for grad school, and it was like really at the start of that that I kind of started from scratch, like having a little bit of knowledge of just like, you know, general outdoor etiquette and things, but really didn't know anything. Um, and so started rock climbing, backpacking, 
um, backcountry skiing, mountaineering, all of those things. Um, and then, you know, during that time, I was still running just for fun, kind of to stay in shape. Um, and it, you know, it took a couple of years before that I started trail running and then also starting to really realize like, oh, wow, like once you have this, this endurance and the ability to just go and run or hike for hours um, and you've got the technical skill sets, there's really a lot of cool things that you can do, especially um, in the Northwest area. So um, yeah, it's been, you know, years of, of building up to the place where I can kind of do this stuff now. And I think like building up endurance and also building technical skills, those all were kind of happening in parallel, but also kind of at, at different times too. So I'm excited to talk to everybody about, about some of that stuff too. Cool. This is great. This is really fantastic. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just launch a poll and this is for our audience. Um, we want to know who we're talking to. Like our general assumption um, is that a lot of folks tuning in have a trail running and endurance orientation. Um, but we also want to know about like, you know, your mountain skills and the other things you do in the mountains. And, you know, kind of, kind of, if you could just answer, there's really three questions here that kind of outline, you know, the activities that you do in the mountains. Um, and then some, a question that kind of gives us a sense of how long you have been running over a series of time, you know, whether that's zero to two years with some racing, whether that's three to five years with a consistent running practice. And then we're curious about the mountain skills that you feel like you already have some proficiency in. Um, so while that's kind of populating, I'll give folks, you know, a couple minutes to just kind of be filling that out in the background. Um, maybe I'll just kind of lead a little bit with what I'm kind of hoping kind of some of the takeaways might be, and then we kind of work backwards from that. So fundamentally, you know, I think as we talk about alpine skills, like one, this isn't necessarily a instructional conversation. Like the point of tonight's conversation is not to teach you how to read maps. It's not to teach you how to self-arrest. It's not to teach you necessarily a checklist of things you need to have, but really to kind of discuss a mindset of curiosity um, and how, how kind of approaching the mountains from a respectful and a curious posture um, can, can, can kind of build on um, you know, what are the next steps that are appropriate for each person individually? And it was really kind of interesting to hear just in his introductions from everyone, like how that's a pretty natural process of like, oh, you know, what's on that next peak? Um, oh, what happens if I combine my endurance with the ability to travel over snow? Like what sort of possibilities are happening? Um, you know, inside of there, there's definitely a nugget of curiosity. Um, and so that's, that's really the frame and the lens that we want to use um, to, to kind of get at some of these principles. So, um, so great. I'm going to see, I'll leave this poll open for about 15 more seconds and I'll end it. So hopefully our panelists will have a chance to kind of look it over and get a sense too for, for who our people are tuning in. Um, and then hopefully that'll, will direct things a little bit more. So, cool. um, Abram, not to interrupt, um, maybe could you just give us a quick recap of what the poll results are? I don't know if you guys could see. Yeah, them. I'm going to end it right now, and then I'm going to share the oh, results. Got it. Thanks. Is that coming through on your end? Yes. Okay, great. I'm glad you can see them because I can't, <laughs> the results that is. Do you guys see those? Um, I can see them. I could give a real quick kind okay. of overview if that's helpful. Yeah, why don't you do that? that, that then, uh, then everyone kind of knows kind of who, who it is that's showing up for this. Yeah, um, okay. So I'm not gonna go through everything because it's gonna take a lot of time, but um, in terms of like, how do people travel in the mountains? It looks like 
uh, the majority of people here identify as either being a hiker, runner, um, or a backpacker. Um, there's a few, quite a few people too that do kind of mountaineering and fast packing, um, but those are the top things. And then in terms of running background, actually it's pretty evenly split across, across the board. So a range of, you know, zero running, zero to two years of running experience um, to over six to 10 years of travel in the mountains. Um, and then in terms of skill sets that people have, um, looks like the majority of people are pretty comfortable with reading a map and route planning, and also with backcountry camping, backpacking, and, and fast packing. Um, and then there's a, a smaller portion of people that know like first aid, off trail navigation, snow travel, glacier travel, that's all um, quite a bit lower. So hopefully that's helpful context for, for everyone. Um, and I guess just even like reading those results, I, I relate a lot because I feel like that's how, I've, how I would have listed myself a couple of years ago too, before I started doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to start. Cool. So um, let's kind of maybe go, I don't know, let's see, how do we want to kind of like, so, so Kayla, you said you kind of see yourself kind of represented in these kind of these numbers so i mean is there kind of a um like how did that how did that shift start for you how did you start making that transition you know what were sort of the either the routes or the partners or you know the things that kind of like led you to start kind of leaning into you know wanting to develop more technical skills um, for me, it actually had nothing to do with running when I first started. I came to Washington as a snowboarder and really loved, just loved snowboarding. Um, and so wanted to start doing backcountry travel as a splitboarder. So I took some avalanche education, um, got involved in teaching of some of those courses over the years as well. Um, and then, you know, so that, that was kind of the first step. Then after that, you know, for backcountry skiing, we have a ton of volcanoes here. I really wanted to learn how to have the skill sets, not only to ski the volcano, you know, to ski, just ski, but also ski the volcanoes. Um, so that led to then like getting some knowledge in glacier travel and crevasse rescue. Um, you know, and I think for me, that was kind of the in. And then like I had said at the beginning in the intro, you know, I was just dabbling in trail running at that time. And then it was a couple of years later where I was, you know, able to cover 30 miles by myself in the mountains. And, um, you know, I started to get interested in some of the routes like that we have in Washington. So like Mount Olympus, for example, was one of the routes that I really wanted to be able to do where it's about 40 miles round trip. It involves, you know, you have to be able to cover that distance, but you also need to be proficient on the glacier. Um, and then like Glacier Peak would be another example that's really similar to that. So both of those two routes, I had heard of other people doing before in a day and was really curious about that. Um, but that was probably four or five years after I started um, developing the skill sets to travel in the backcountry as a, as a split border and then also like on the volcanoes. Yeah, that's, that's a really helpful timeline you know, to kind of lay that out, to kind of like really recognize like this, like these were a skill set that required over years. Is that, is that a, is that a safe reframe? Like, like how long was of a yeah. process was that for you? Yeah. Uh, for me, it was, um, yeah, I guess between, between like the first few times and then doing routes like that, it was, a, it was a couple of years. Um, and I think there's also a difference in, at least for me, like my experience, when I, I mentioned I took some, some courses. So one of the courses I took was a glacier travel and crevasse rescue course. So I took that course. It was like a month long through the mountaineers. Um, I've done actually a few things with them that I, I think it's a great organization for option for people to learn how to do some of these skill sets. But I did that course. And then like, technically speaking, I had all of the knowledge that I needed to successfully climb Rainier. Like I knew how to pull someone out of a crevasse. I knew all the rope management, you know, we spent time practicing travel on the glacier and everything. So that summer, um, I went out with friends of mine who I was rock climbing and stuff with at the time, we went out to go try to climb Rainier and we ended up bailing. Um, we just, 
we weren't moving efficiently enough through that terrain to be able to, to make that work. And like, even this was, we were doing it as like a three day climb, which, um, you know, a lot of people when there's, you know, that's a pretty standard way to climb or near. Um, it was not, you know, the second year, then we came back and, and ended up climbing it. But over that course of the year, it was like the wake up call of like, okay, on paper, I have the skills I can, <laughs> I can do this, but then it's actually, it takes a, it takes a while to get the experience to be able to like, still move efficiently through some of that terrain. Um, you know, and, and in the meantime, in that next year, we went back and actually helped teach, like as volunteer instructors, helped teach that course that we had taken the year before. And it really wasn't until then that you just like get super dialed on learning all that stuff. And it really, I think, was a game changer for my confidence in that kind of terrain too. We spent a lot of time out on the glaciers practicing the skills. Um, and so, yeah, it's I think like, you know, that's just one example of glacier travel, but I think you could take the same um, approach for a lot of different types of skill sets you might want to develop. Like you can start start small and start dabbling in it, but it really, I think, is like learning the skills and then getting experiences with, ideally with other people who are more experienced than you or having good partners that you can actually get out there and like practice stuff and learn and and bail and then come back and be like, okay, what did we do wrong? How can we do this better next time? How can we move more efficiently you know, all those kinds of questions. And I think, you know, it's, it's great to like get those skill sets, um, but you really need to put them into practice, I think. And for me, that's been a really big part of my journey and doing more stuff in the Alpine. Cool. So I'm going to kind of pick up on a thread that you kind of mentioned there in that process and maybe kind of hand it over to Kyle a little bit because he shares a similar kind of trajectory. And then we'll come to Jenny. She came, came out kind of a little bit different way, but like, you know, Kyle, Caitlin talked a lot about like bailing, you know, and like I'm kind of implying that like some failed objectives. Um, I'm curious what that process was like for you, you know, from like, you know, starting out in the lowland foothills to some of your first climbs. We can, you know, we both of you reference Rainier in your introduction, like what sort of like moments of bailing and failure for you were really educational in those early years of skill development? Yeah, um, I definitely, so I, when I started out, like really going into the mountains, really going after it, I was 17 years old um, and didn't have any mentorship or didn't have any, you know, guidance and stuff. It was just me and my friends like going out and doing stuff. And one like experience that stands out is like, um, we tried to do the index Persis, Persis index traverse in like late May when it was still like very snowy and uh we were completely underprepared gear wise. You know, I still at this point did not even own a, an ice axe or crampons. And there was a section we were traversing steep snow. And with just hiking poles and micro spikes, I eventually slipped on the icy snow and took a long slide, lost my glasses. And at that point, I was, I didn't have LASIK. So that was a big deal. Unfortunately, um, like ended up in a tree well, but it definitely could have been worse. And we bailed and turned back after that. And that definitely uh, caused me to dial it back a little bit and realize that um, there were more steps I needed to take instead of just like jumping towards this big objective. Um, and that things change a lot in the seasons. That's like, you know, I had like red trip reports about that traverse being done and I saw pictures of like nice tarns and lakes in the summer and it all seemed pretty straightforward. Maybe it is in August, but like, you know, early season, you, you know, even into June, July, there can still be a lot of snow and snow travel is like something that seems very simple, maybe on paper, but it's actually, I think like one of the most foundational skills of uh, moving in the Alpine here because we have snow year round. Um, you can't really underestimate the importance of being able to just move efficiently on snow, be able to look at a snow slope and say, like, can I cross that safely? And, you know, be honest with yourself. Do I have trail runners? Do I have mountaineering boots? Do I have an ice axe? Do I have crampons? Um, is it the right time of day for the snow to be soft? And all those things I didn't have experience with. Um, and so, like, going forward, I just, like, was a lot more cautious and realized, like, snow was a medium. I was not familiar with, but I wanted to get better at. So I did a lot of snowy hikes. I spent a lot of time practicing with an ice axe, learning how to self-arrest. Um, and now I feel like snow travel is one of my strengths in that I can really move efficiently. I can judge 
when to put on crampons, when to not put on crampons. I can judge what I can do in running shoes and where I would need mountaineering boots. Um, and I think that that really unlocks so much because if you have to wait until the trails are snow free here, you know, you might be waiting until August. Cool. Thanks, Jenny. You've, you spent a lot of time like developing a lot of technical skills, you know, for technical climbing and being in the mountains, you know, and, and how do you feel like that time and that investment in those foundations supported you in sort of that transition to being a runner, kind of developing that skill set first? And, you know, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Hmm. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, the idea of like developing mountain sense, like I hear Kyle and Caitlin talk about this too, like it feels like one of the more important aspects and it, it you can't, you can't speed that up is like, I think what I take the most from my upbringing and my youth in the mountains. And I, um, I, I, I think the running thing is like, for me, very secondary to like knowing how to read mountain terrain and be on snow and, um, travel safely. And, um, I think that most anybody that's fit can go out and, and, and make it happen just because you're not really running all that much and you're doing a lot of walking, but the thing, the thing that is, that is like the prerequisite to all that is the mountain sense. And so, um, I spent a lot of time wearing boots and I spent a lot of time roped up on glaciers in like my teens and twenties. And, um, I spent a lot of time on a rope and, um, like really traveling really heavy and slow and, um, like putting my time in, in that way, I guess, like, you know, I climbed El Dorado in three days before I did it in four and a half hours, or I did the Tarmigan Traverse in seven days. So I think like there were, there were years and years and years of, of, um, putting my time in, in the mountains like that before I even put on running shoes in the front country. Um, and I think it's like hard to, hard to, underestimate that like hard and and hard to also force it like um yeah hard to speed that up and I can imagine like if I hadn't had all that and I was fit now and like was like oh my gosh all these people are running in the mountains and like I'm a runner I want to go running in the mountains like you and you're like oh the Tarmigan Traverse it's 30 miles long I can go do that but I I think it's just important and I'm sure we all want to make this point but it's important to recognize that there's a background and a foundation there that um, it's hard to, you, like the, the fitness is not for me, what came first, it was the mountain sense and the, um, and the experience, just like the base of like, not, yeah. Yeah. Like well, the things that we do in the mountains that maybe you hear about, there are so many complications other than just the fitness. And usually the fitness is more of a given and the fitness is not even the challenge and in the style, if you want to do things in fast and light style, you are reducing your margin of error. And to be able to accept that margin of error, you have to come from years of experience and going with other people, learning from people and starting out with more of a margin. And then you learn how to trim that down. You learn what gear items you can bring down. You learn how much faster, how much more you can squeeze into a day. And I think that all of us really um, have done that over many years. And maybe that's not something you see. Maybe you just see us going out and doing those things, but it's important to recognize like where we came from. Yeah, Caitlin, I see you nodding your head and I'm, I'm kind of curious. I got a question for you around this, um, this idea. I think there's this kind of common, I think we've all been there as runners where we just kind of get in the zone, we get this tunnel vision you know, we're, we're breathing, we're exerting, we're, we're, we're used to kind of pushing through those kind of hard moments. And I'm curious, maybe this question for you is like, how are you going to balance that kind of psychological space that is called to us when we're physically kind of at, you know, or pushing our endurance, but like, how do we kind of, how do you preserve a headspace where you can like have that mountain sense? How do you kind of balance that, that, psychological space of awareness plus like oh i'm in this like hard place moving in the mountains yeah um i think i'll just relate this back to racing because um i'm sure a few at least a few people in the 
um, panel here and, and in the audience know this, but like the extent that I will push myself in a race is absolutely on an entirely different planet than what I will do in the Alpine. Um, I think like the, you know, I, we think about like racing and pushing through things being really hard or even on a training run doing that. Um, and my risk tolerance for that is pretty high. You know, I, I kind of know, um, you know, maybe I don't have cell service, but I have probably have my phone with me. I'm probably within a few miles of a trailhead. I know I have friends that will be running on the trails later after me, or I'm in an, a controlled race environment where um, there are risk mitigation um, steps being put in place for me. Um, and I think, you know, the way I think about it is like when I'm going out into the mountains, and this could be even just on a trail run, if I'm going for a, you know, a long solo trail run, or if I'm going off trail and going on snow and glaciers or scrambling, um, I need to be prepared to be fully self-sufficient. And so, you know, I think, you know, like Kyle was mentioning this and Jenny too, about like not rushing this. I think it's like, you know, for me, I like to think about what gear do I have with me and how am I choosing to travel? And what does that mean? Like if shit hits the fan, you know, like I can go out on a perfect day, have an amazing, you know, amazing snow conditions, amazing weather, go, you know, summit some mountain in a couple of hours, come back down, have a beer at the car and have, you know, wow, great. That was so fun. But like, that's not what we're preparing for, right? Like it's great if that happens. And of course those are like the days we always talk about, but you know, what we're preparing for is like, what happens when shit hits the fan and inevitably like it will, because we're moving in risky areas. Right. So like, what are the, what are the risks that I'm taking on when I'm in that kind of environment? Um, and how am I mitigating those risks either through my decision-making or through the gear that I have with me? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just like, um, it, it's different. Cause like, I, I like to, you know, I, I do like taking risks in certain environments, but I think when it comes to like alpine terrain, I'm actually fairly risk averse. And I um, am always just kind of thinking like a few steps ahead of like, okay, if so, if this thing happened, what what would we do? Or if this happened, like, do I have the gear I, I need and the skill sets or the medicine knowledge or whatever it is, right? To be able to handle things when we're 20 miles away from the nearest trailhead. So um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot more, I think that goes into it, but for me, like that's, I think all of us probably agree. Like that's part of the, that's part of the fun of it. Um, it's a whole new set of, of challenges and logistics to think about. Um, and it's just a very different environment than like handing over the planning reins to someone else and just pushing yourself. I think, um, we all probably get a lot of, um, I don't know, satisfaction out of being able to like do the, all that planning and put all those things together because it just, I guess, uh, allows you to be curious and like allows you to push that creativity a little bit more. Um, so it can be a really, really fun way to, to go on an adventure too. Yeah. As you were talking about that kind of, it kind of reminded me of a principle that's often taught in avalanche, you know, traveling in avalanche terrain is it being a wicked environment in the sense that you can go out, you can have a great ski day conditions can be awesome. Um, you know, your, your perception of the conditions that are awesome, come back to the car and be like, oh, wow, we did everything great because we're all alive and everything is successful. Um, and potentially because, you know, of, you know, whatever, you may or may not have been traveling in safe avalanche terrain. Like there's these, you may be there were weak layers in the snowpack and you just don't even know that. So it kind of makes me think about that principle as we think about you know, this light and fast ethic, right? Like, you know, we see all these evidences of people traveling and moving fast in the mountains and they, they came back and they were okay. Or, you know, we go out and we have these days in the mountains and because we nailed those conditions or the conditions are just right, we, you know, we can develop this perception of like, oh, well, I've got everything figured out. And so I really appreciate that, that perspective of, of like, you know, anticipation and thinking ahead. And so, so I'm, yeah, so I'm curious kind of is, is you, I'll kind of lob this one out there and see who picks it up is like, so what, what sort of kind of like, I mean, if you were to kind of talk to people sort of about like the decision-making process for, for evaluating, 
you know, a route or evaluating an, an objective? You know, are there are there guidelines or principles that you would sort of say are 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 ways to to kind of align? Like, well, this is the skills that I have, and is this a match for for the objective that I've that I've lined up for myself? You know, and how how do you, how do you find an appropriate match? Well, I think it's really challenging. Um, in climbing, I think it's much easier because you have like numbered grades and you can be like, I'm a five, nine climber. You know, I should be fine on like this five, seven route. Uh, and, and it's challenging to look at just like distances and elevation gain. So I think that some keys are like reaching out to the community and like talking to people who have done, you know, maybe the peak you want to do or the route you want to do to understand um, like the relative difficulty in comparison to other things. I think it's great to start with more established and more known objectives. So if you're trying to build up, say, the experience of like um, scramble routes, you know, you're not sure, you know, if you're ready for this third or fourth class scramble. I think it's good to start like with more popular objectives where there's it's more of a known entity and you can also get more known information about conditions. Every time that you start to layer another unknown, um, you're either adding more risk or you need to move further back from your like, from your ability level. That's kind of how I see it. Um, and it's a gradual process. I think that there's no like simple answer there. There's actually, uh, we've got a question coming in from the audience. And I think, I think we could totally open it up to folks who are tuning in if they've got questions. You know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of experience on our panel. And if there's other topics or questions that people have in this vein, it'd be great to field those. Um, looks like someone's asking, Caitlin, if you've had experiences where your training didn't fully prepare you for what you were encountered. And then how did you manage that? So I'm kind of imagining this kind of situation like, oh, I think I'm a little bit in over my head. Now what sort of a scenario? Um, yeah, and I, I guess training, um, I'm taking that to be like endurance or run training, but I'll try to answer it more broadly too. So I don't, I actually can't think of maybe a single time outside of a, race environment where I've just had poor preparation, which has happened. Um, I can't think of a time when like my fitness or endurance training wasn't there to do a route. Like, I think we kind of said this before, like, I think oftentimes that's really not the limiting factor. It's, um, how efficiently you're navigating or moving on terrain and what gear you brought. Um, but there are definitely times when I've been out, when I've either underestimated, um, the technicality of a route um, or where I've brought the wrong gear because I underestimated uh, the conditions of the route. And then in both of those circumstances, so I'm thinking one time I went up to try to climb the Couts route um, with some friends and we were going to try to climb it in a day, single push like I've done on Rainier and various other routes. And it just like it was, it was biting off more than I could chew uh, definitely on that day. But even looking back, I think I overestimated my skill set to be able to move as efficiently as we needed to on that train. Um, so we ended up bailing um, and that was a really great learning experience. And then there's another time when I was uh, climbing a route on Mount Stewart in Leavenworth and we brought trail runners and, and um, kind of flexible aluminum crampons which I've done lots of things with before, but I think on that, um, on that snow pitch and how steep it was and what the snow conditions were like, we just underestimated how far that gear could take us. And we also ended up bailing because it just took too long and we're like, this would be dumb to keep moving. So there's a lot of times actually where I've, um, underestimated something, but I've never gotten myself into a tricky scenario because we've always, you know, I've always kind of decided to, to just bail. And I think, a mantra that I like to keep in the mountains with my partners is like the mountains not going anywhere. It's it's going to be there. We can we can come back. You know, let's go back to the car. We can always go back another day and like learn from this. Um, so yeah, I'm sure actually Jenny and Kyle, I'm sure you guys have experiences with this too. So maybe you guys can chime in. I I always say that mantra too, Caitlin, and I I think it's super important to adopt that 
we have all the time in the world and the mountain's not going anywhere. And, and one thing that I would say uh, um, regarding this topic is it's not a bad idea to go do something slow first and, and, and get your margin of error super large, um, make it overnight, make it fun, just go like suss it out. And it's time spent in the mountains is time spent in the mountains and it's valuable. And, um, you know, as I, I can't imagine what it's like to be a runner approaching the sport of mountain running, um, like wanting to just, you know, there's a, a, to me, there's a sequence and there's, and that's why there's things like the mountaineers. And that's why, um, Ronald asked a question in the Q and a about like, he's done some guided climbs and he's wondering how to go out and do that stuff on his own. And, you know, there's the mountaineers and there's like the American Alpine Institute has, has courses that you can take to learn skills. And, um, I think those things are pretty imperative and it's part of like, it's, it's part of the history in Europe of climbing is, is mentorship and, um, it, finding a way to not be guided, but to, to be part of a, an instructional course that empowers you to like, go do it yourself feels pretty important to me. Um, but yeah, yeah. Don't be afraid of like doing something slow and heavy. We all got to do it and, and get your margins really wide and carry a lot of fun stuff, bring whiskey with you or something. <laughs> yeah. I used to really try to cut every ounce Um, and I've kind of gone back on that recently because I've realized that really I should gear up for the most hazardous part of the journey. And even if that's, you know, an 18 hour day climbing the Northridge Mount Stewart that involves one hard pitch of rock climbing, I'm going to make sure I bring the cams to protect that pitch. Or, you know, it's like you got across that one steep snow field. Well, how stupid would it feel to get five hours into your day and have to turn around because you didn't bring crampons to cross that one snowfield? I've been there. It sucks. And when I look back, I'm like, is one extra pound really like maybe it'll make me 10 minutes slower, right? An extra pound on my back. But it's not going to it's not going to like change fundamentally the enjoyment of the experience or like my time. And it's not like I'm going for an FKT or anyways, like when, when you're on the fence about like, should you bring that gear item? I'm now almost always, I'm like, this time I'm going to bring it. As Jenny said, maybe then you, if you're really all about speed, you can go and you can repeat it um, in a future year or in a later that week with the knowledge that you can like leave that piece of gear behind. Obviously, if you keep thinking that in like forever, you might end up with you know twice as much weight and then you're going to end up doing it in two days like jenny said and there's nothing wrong with that too so just i try to like err on the side of caution now yeah there's the great climbing adage which is it's like oh i'm just taking the rack for a walk you know it's like oh I'm just, you know, my gear has been sitting in the closet. I'm going to take it for a walk. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, we didn't bust it out because the conditions weren't right, you know, and those things. And that's, that's, that's another classic one. I think that's a really, I really appreciate bringing that out, Kyle, just because I think, you know, it's really easy for me to imagine a scenario of someone, you know, wanting to be light and fast and stripping that weight and they get out there and you get to be, you know, 10 miles in midway up that objective. And like, that that risk management equation can shift drastically you know and so then you start having this wrestling conversation with yourself of like well i've come all the way here you know like i've made this big effort and well you know it's only you know it's only this one section you know and then and then all of a sudden your your risk equation and the consequence is completely different and you're making that decision you know, with a perception of, of higher consequence or like higher expectations for completing that objective. And so, you know, so I think just kind of to kind of really just reiterate a couple of things you've said is like, you know, one, like being really know what the technical, you know, consequences and objectives are of the routes that you're doing, you know, and then and being prepared with that gear to be able to meet that, you know, even if it's just that one pitch, I just think that that's some really valuable wisdom and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, cool. So if folks have any other questions, feel free to keep populating them in the Q and A or the chat. Happy to do it. Um, Christy asked about what kind of gear we carry. Yeah, go for it. Um, I can just say what I carry and I'm sure I know it's very similar to what Caitlin and Kyle carry. Actually. Um, I use the black diamond distance 15 pack for, for a lot of things. 
it's not like what I use for everything, but when I'm carrying a rope and um, crampons and a helmet, you can stick it all in there. Um, and it has great like front storage on it too. So you can just eat while you go. Um, the, the Petzl leopard crampons are what we all use. I think they're aluminum lightweight crampons and they pack down super small. And then there's different axes, but I use a camp ax and I actually, I sawed the bottom off to make it even shorter. Cause generally when you're out in the mountains, you really only need like the top little bit. Um, so that's just a little tip. And then, um, the Petzl rad line is something that, um, is widely used and you can get a 30 meter length of it. And if you have to repel a long distance, you and your partner can both carry a Petzl rad line and then you tie them together and you have a, a full 30 meter repel length that you can use. And that's a, it's rated for glacier travel. It's meant for glacier travel. And it actually, when you buy it, it comes with a whole like micro traction pulley system. So, um, it's good incentive to learn crevasse rescue. If you buy yeah, the, the rad, the rad system is really sweet. It is pricey, but the rad line plus like the tip lock and my trip micro tracks, they work super well. Like you can build a pulley far pulley to get someone out of a crevasse far better. And it's so light. It's like half the weight of, you know, other glacier ropes. And I think it's really important to have like your safety gear light because then it's less of a question. Like, do we bring it that then it's just like, Oh, it's like a, two pounds, of course we bring it. And when something becomes heavier, then you start asking the question, ah, do we really need it? That's when you get into like rougher situations. So, um, I do think it's important to have lightweight, high quality gear you can like depend on. Yeah. I'll, I'll, if I can just jump on that. Um, I'm flat thinking because like when I, so I mentioned, I took uh, my like glacier travel and crevasse rescue course through the mountain years, years ago. And, uh, so I started with like pretty heavy gear um, and a lot of it and all these like fancy, really uh, like good ways to perform rescue. But over the years now, I've like kind of, uh, I don't know, adjusted and enlightened my my own kit. Um, and I actually I do have a red line, but I've never actually used the like we I just got a red line. Um, and so actually I now, I guess for like 10 years, I've been using a heavier rope with slightly heavier glacier rescue kit and I don't really care. It works for me and I know how to use it really well. And, um, I, again, kind of like what we mentioned before, like, you know, if is an extra pound really going to slow me down that much? Like, no, if I'm really need the year. And I also find like, if it's a route where you're going to be having a harness on and everything attached to it, like, you don't really, I mean, I don't know. I don't really notice like an extra carabiner or something. So, um, definitely, I think I agree with you guys, but I, I guess want to, say too that like all this gear is really expensive and it is okay to like have heavier gear and and start with that and do a lot of really fun big trips even with slightly heavier gear and then over time you'll start to learn like what things you like and what you don't like and then um you can kind of start replacing bit by bit as you as you go and this probably goes without saying but it's important to say too is like you know you can have all the fancy gear on your pack and in your kit but unless you're really confident how to use it and apply it in the field, you know, it's, it's just some shiny stuff that you're carrying around in your backpack. So, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone would echo this, but the importance of like, when you purchase that equipment, you know, take it out and use it and plan days in the field where it's not a big objective and you're really dedicating time to develop that craft of applying and deploying and using the ice ax you know, making sure crampons are on effectively, employing that rad line, you know, learning to repel in a very low consequence situation, you know, so that you're not like busting it out on the glacier for the first time, you know, trying to figure out how these systems work. Mm -hmm. So, which goes yeah. back to like, I think a combination of, of instruction, but like, you know, there's a lot that can be learned just by practicing, just, just taking that equipment into the snow and into the field and using it. So. I think it's also important to mention that not every, not every cool mountain route involves a glacier or technical travel and a cool way to like, you know, get your feet wet doesn't need to, doesn't need to be gear heavy. Doesn't need to be like technical, big mountain skill heavy. Like you can climb glacier peaks sometimes without stepping on snow. And like, there's, a, you can get into the pickets without being on a glacier. Um, there's just, there's endless things and, and there's lots of ways to, to get out into the mountains without 
if, if you don't want to, if you don't want to touch that yet, don't, you don't need to, if you're just curious about other things, you don't need to get on a glacier. So I think that's an important, that's important. I would say what I think there's, we've, we've kind of talked about um, a lot of different skills. Maybe I just want to kind of like mention kind of first aid, you know, and sort of emergency communication. You know, we've talked about, you know, snow and some rope travel and like, how does that sort of, you know, first aid emergency response you know, system play into your confidence when you're going into, into backcountry terrain? I know Caitlin just got her woofer. I, I can, I can say that. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I finally took my woofer, so wilderness first responder three years ago, I think, and then just got my research done. Um, and that is something I've been wanting to do for years, but to be honest, it's pretty time intensive. You need, I think it's like a 10 day course, um, which is hard for those of us who have to count vacation days. So that, that was a tricky thing to do, but honestly, I think like that was the most useful thing I think I've done for myself for the out, for outdoor travel, um, you can do shorter versions of that. So like a wilderness first aid course, you can do that usually like in a, just a weekend. Um, and I think the key for all this stuff is like, okay, so we, we bring first aid kits with us, hopefully everyone does bring something. Um, but you know, when, you know, if, if there's an accident, like, do you actually really know what to do with that? And, you know, I think treating someone for, you know, a sprained ankle might be a very different thing if you're just running on Cougar Mountain versus if you are like 30 miles deep into the pickets and, uh, you know, you're days away from, from any help. So for me, I think that's been, um, that's been helpful. And I don't think everyone in my, like most of my partners don't have all of that training, but I feel like I'm competent enough in it that I can kind of direct if needed, unless I'm Unless I'm totally out of it, <laughs> then we've got bigger problems. Unless you're unconscious. <laughs> yeah. And yeah actually, I, don't know, I think it's, it's really fun too. It, it's a fun. It's a fun skill set to do, especially if you like can sign up with a friend or something and just go do some of those courses. I think um, can just increase confidence when you know you have to be self reliant. I want to. You you brought something that raised a question for me that I want to kind of plug out there. I think is really important that we haven't touched on yet, but that is partners and like you know. Who, who you spend time with in the mountains you know so like I'm curious if um maybe you've got us without naming names maybe you've had some bad partner experiences mm -hmm. or you know maybe there's this process of like you know maybe this is not something I, I I'm not necessarily comfortable being in the mountains with this person um or on the other hand like how do you go about finding that alignment because really we're kind of talking about communication at this point um, you know, making sure that your objectives are aligned with your partner's objectives and how, how do you kind of establish those communication expectations with people, you know, before you go into the field together? Um, I think it's really important to establish that, like, any, like, anyone I go into the mountains with, like, they can say anything at any time. Like you, you want to make sure that you can be honest with each other, um, that, you know, at any point someone can say, I'm not feeling it, maybe we should turn around, or I just, I want to go back, or I don't feel comfortable about this decision. And I don't have like a great answer for how, how you do that. I think it's just kind of establishing trust early on, establishing a two-way dialogue, like, even if I am the more experienced person, I'll try to like ask, what do you think about this? Like at different stages or like where you think, how, how should we tackle this section? Um, try to keep people like engaged in the decision-making because I think it's really dangerous when one person like takes over all the decision-making. Um, I've definitely been guilty of that before. And even if it doesn't turn out badly, it definitely just, I think makes for a, uh, a less fun experience for everyone. I think I thought about partnership a lot because you can't really climb without a partner. And that's kind of has been my route in, into mountain running. And um, I have just like literally 
like three women that I go into the mountains with and, and they are like gold to me. And I, I really don't go with many other people. And so I'd say like, when you find somebody, hold on to them. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like wary about the prospect of going out with someone and, and, and calling it off or like saying, Hey, this doesn't work. Like, I really think finding a good mountain partner is like finding a life partner in a way, like you can have partner breakups and it's fine because it, it, it says nothing. It just like with a relationship, it doesn't need to say anything bad about the people involved. It just says that there's different objectives and different ways of, of doing things. And I think it's a good thing to be really particular about. And, and I'd say if you pull it off, right, those will become some of your best friends. Um, but I, yeah, I, 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 it's continuously tricky, um, but a good place to be particular, I guess, is where I'll stay with that. Hmm. Cool. This is great. There was a question that came in here, um, just kind of like, and it's this one specifically a question around a cramp on gear with lightweight gear you trade the durability and sometimes security less purchase, you know, how do you consider trade offs with your gear. Um, you know, maybe I'll just chime in because I can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it really begins with like knowing, you know, what the limits of you and what the function specifically of all of your pieces of equipment can, can and cannot do, like knowing where their limits are. And then, you know, knowing, you know, what exactly your equipment is. I mean, exactly is really hard. Kind of having a, a clear sense of what you're going to be called, what you're going to be asking your equipment to do for you in the field, you know, and so being able to experiment in low consequence situations, you know, with a variety of different tools and to know how they perform, not just, you know, from the rating or the manufacturer's label or from what you watched on YouTube, but like having, you know, that equipment on your feet and like using that particular tool in those particular scenarios in, in low consequence situations. And so that you have I mean, a lot of we've kind of come back to this theme of mountain sense. And I think it's such a beautiful you know, and clear um, principle, but that we don't really speak to really specifically, but you will develop that sense, you know, of your equipment and how you move with it by using and experimenting with it. Um, and then I think to kind of go back to a point Kyle made earlier is like, if you're in that situation of, of judging ounces versus security in a, in a risky situation, like, you know, you know, err on that side of a little extra weight for extra security but you know that's that's a principle um we're kind of wrapping up i kind of want to maybe kind of come back to this mountain sense theme just a little bit as we close and maybe just kind of hear from from maybe the three from the three of you um maybe just kind of your definition of what this mountain sense is to maybe put it in a, into some words in a way that the folks can kind of come away with as something that they would want to cultivate or how do you cultivate the mountain sense? Um, just maybe a little takeaway from, each, from, from the three of you on that. I would say it's basically just like an innate sense of direction when faced with kind of a subjective decision in the mountains. And um, I think the experience is really the best way to do it. I mean, it's just like putting yourself in, you know, starting with safer situations, lower consequence terrain, experimenting, trying different things, going out in a variety of different conditions in a variety of different ways. And you'll eventually be able to build on that experience. I also think it comes from listening to other people. Other people have great stories. You know, you hear about accidents, you hear about successes and take those lessons from people who have spent a lot of time in the mountains and internalize them because, you know, hopefully someone's bad experience is there's something you can learn from that and it's experience you don't have to go through yourself. Um, okay, I'll go next. Um, I think it to me it kind of comes to like having respect for the mountains and um i totally agree with kyle and i think feel similarly about like being able to navigate and think read terrain but ultimately like i just try to really have respect for the places that i'm traveling um and 
that covers a lot of things. I think that means like treating um, the habitat and nature and wildlife and everything with respect, leave no trace. But it also means like understanding maybe the severity of the mountains and how um, how small we are with respect to them and just respecting that space and, and kind of goes back to the thing that uh, Jenny and I said before that like, you know, the mountains aren't going anywhere. Um, ultimately the mountains are in charge and either they'll let us pass or they're not going to. And I think, you know, I think about that with um, weather or conditions and things. And I think um, I try to just keep, um, you know, keep that in mind as I'm navigating through terrain or coming up with goals and thinking about things about just knowing that I'm just a small little blip on this like massive terrain and, uh, you know, keeping that perspective, um, can keep you humble, but also excited too. Um, I would say the, the word that comes to mind when I think about mountain sense is intuition. And I would say that intuition is like, it's, you can't get it from a book and you can't get it from watching movies and you can't get it from doing anything but going out and experiencing the mountains. And um, I think it's an earned thing over time. Um, and I would say like for aspiring mountain runners, like just get out in the mountains in as many capacities as you can. Like if it means to going on a guided trip up Rainier or whatever, like awesome, do that. Uh, get a, go on a rock climb at Washington Pass. Get just like, get off the trail in as, in as many safe ways as you can. And I, I, I really think, and I think Kyle and Caitlin, like just the, the ways that they've approached this is, has echoed this, like you kind of got to become a climber and a mountaineer to be a, a, a proficient mountain runner. And, um, yeah, I think that's a great way to gain mountain sense is just get in technical situations really safely. And you might need a lot more gear for that. And you might need to try another sport for that too, but, um, I think it's a cool process and it, it all comes back to curiosity too. So, yeah. You mean I have to spend more time in the mountains, to develop mountain sense. <laughs> Hard. What a good deal. Yeah, no, Sucks. I appreciate, I, yeah. What, I mean, man, you're saying you have to spend time in the mountains. Okay. All right. <laughs> Item number one on my list. So no, I, I really appreciate your insights on this. Um, I think there is a strong connection between mountain sense and curiosity. Um, and I think the, the you know, principle here that I'd kind of just love to kind of just add my two cents um, is the curiosity will lead people. I, I really kind of, kind of, this is kind of my, my, my mountain sense intuition is, is kind of feels confident saying like, your curiosity will lead you in the right places. Like, you know, we have, um, an ability and an intuition and awareness as human beings that is an incredible gift. And I think the mountains, you know, helps us become more in tune with that. Um, you know, I feel really fortunate to have spent, you know, long days in the mountains and in that process, you become more in tune with yourself. And as you, as you adopt an open and curiosity mindset, like, you learn, you learn through your senses, you learn through your feet, through the rock, the texture, the weather, the textures of the snow. And there's this, there's this call to awareness that is, is deeply intertwined with, with being in the mountains, which is, which is a great gift um, that, that the mountains and these wild spaces offer us. And so in that process, I think it's really important to honor the wisdom that that we're receiving because I believe that that wisdom will match us kind of where we are like if I've been in places where I'm like you know what I'm on the south facing snow slope and it's steep this is not where I want to be right now and it's not because I necessarily read it in a book like yeah if I've read in a book I shouldn't be in these warm saturated slopes but like you feel it like it's in your body um, and so part of that sense is is I think is learning to honor what it is that your body and your heart and your mind are telling you and to bring that in alignment. Um, you know, in that sense, I think, you know, being curious about conditions, being curious about landforms, being curious about weather systems, being curious about what's on the other side of that ridge, you know, being curious about what are the skills I need to do to do that. 
and then pairing that with with an awareness and a respect for the places is is a great synergy for developing that mountain sense and intuition so mm -hmm. yeah so thank you this has been lovely this has been super wonderful i really appreciate the conversation we've been able to have um, I will put in just a plug for folks that are interested and we'll kind of follow up with people that have tuned in. Like one of the things that Aspire is trying to do um, is to kind of is to teach some of these skills in a in a in a for a, in a runner light and fast orientation. And I don't think that supplants, you know, taking an American Alpine Institute course or Mountaineers course. But, you know, what we're trying to do with our skills courses is is say, OK, you know, here are these fundamentals that are universal, you know, for snow and glacier travel, but, you know, negotiate that in, in a, in an environment with other runners who have these, have these interests. So we'll follow up with that. We've got a skills course on Mount Baker. We've got a skills course on Glacier Peak. Um, and we have a, a wilderness first aid skills course for runners as well. So but our goal with this conversation tonight and with those trips is to be able to empower folks with an endurance orientation and a curiosity to feel like they can go out into the hills and develop their mountain sense. So thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone for attending. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for everyone for joining in. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and shut it down. Appreciate everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.